Welcome to Strictly Creative. My name is Gurmami, and we have a filmmaker this time as our guest. His <laughs> name is Alexander Cruz. How are you doing, Alexander? Doing as good as I could possibly be in this weird, strange time of ours, man. And I, like, I know we're tired of calling it that, but it still is, and it's going to be like that for a little while longer. So it just sure is. Ma- sure making is. the best of it, man, making the best of it. For sure, bro. And, and we appreciate your time here. This is uh, going to be a fun conversation speaking yeah. close to, to a filmmaker or a visual storyteller. First question I have for you, sir. How did you get involved in visual storytelling? What motivated you? You know, I've uh, thought about that for a little while. And it's like the, 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 the more that you get into it, the more of a mystery it really is. Like, you know, I've been drawing since I was a kid. Well, I used to draw a lot more when I was a kid, but you know, I had access to a camera. We had a VHS camera at home and we were one of the few families that had one, like it was a shared camera. And I used to make short films and stuff like that. But, you know, I, as to why I pursued it though, and why I say my brother or my sister didn't pursue it, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just an inclination, man. And I'm kind of seeing that just with my brother and his kids and in talking to friends, and maybe you've seen this too with their kids, you know, the kid comes out and it's a baby. And as it's growing older, it takes on a certain personality and you don't know where it comes from, man. You know what I'm saying? It's really mysterious in a way. There's a combination of genetics and environment, what's available to you. But I guess I was really lucky though at a young age to know that I do like expressing myself in a certain way. And that was one of it. But, you know, throughout high school, I was a painter and that's what I really wanted to do. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, but I think more fortunately, I got rejected by the uh, University of Ottawa's fine arts program. The, like, yeah, I had my, my um, interview and the guy just destroyed me. Like it, it was not a good feeling. Even though I knew I kind of wanted to do film at some point, I, uh, you know, I did want to do fine arts, but so I, I, you know, I abandoned that. And then I um, went to school and I did poli sci and I just loved studying issues and documentaries and stuff. And I always knew I wanted to do film. I didn't get into Concordia either. So that was a roadblock that I got into news, the documentaries. And eventually I just got into scripted stuff. And um, yeah, I've been doing it for God, God, 15, 16, 17 years. I can't remember really, but for a long time now. Though. Now you mentioned that when you were a child, you, you were, you were making story, uh, you know, you, you were telling stories. If you don't mind, can you share one of the films? Mm-hmm. You had? Well, what, what sort of stories were, you, you know, making? like they, they, they were like scenes of stuff. Yeah. I, when I was a little, little kid, I, we'd have toys and we'd create movies with them. I'd invite my friends over. We'd shoot a scene from a new James Bond film. We were just uh, dicking around, but from a young age though, like I was already tape to tape editing and, cutting together, you know, scenes from films and the scenes that we shot, ju- juxtaposing things and making it seem like the production value on these things were huge. And uh, it just, I don't know. I, I think um, it was just at a young age, I just loved doing it. Um, I can't explain why. And until this day, like, I think more than anything, I consider myself an editor mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, editors, you know, filmmaking is written three times when it's written as a script when it's written, when it's shot, and then it's written when it's edited. Uh, And and that's what uh, I think Francis Ford Coppola had said. But really, um, if there's anything, if there's one skill that's really going to help you in shooting, it's editing. As a director, like I'm I'm not a diva in that sense. I'm I'm just shooting to edit. I'm just getting what I need to get in post. And in post, like post is kind of like, you know, it's a feeling that I had when I was a kid. It's like, you know, you're in the, the kitchen and you're looking through the oven there and you're seeing that cake rise. All those elements and those ingredients and all that labor that you put into it, it's becoming something. Mm-hmm. And I just actually finished a documentary uh, on, on a friend of mine, a local musician. And uh, I mean, it, it is like it's it actually got me through the, the winter, which was so depressing, man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're more or less trying to tell your own story. In editing and and you're you know you're 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 creating certain affect and it's just it's it's addictive in that sense i don't know like uh yeah I, I, I'm, I'm really liking your the, the honesty in your answers and and the analogies mm-hmm. they're using there uh alexander yeah. now over the years what key values and principles are still relevant to you and how you approach telling a story or working on a project well what are some of your yeah mental sort of values that that you hold well um you know like like one 
you know, when it comes to filmmaking, it's, it's one of the most resource intensive arts out there. It's just, you know, like, it's just the most, like, I'm very envious of like musicians. They just pick up a guitar and write something with, with this sort of thing. Maybe you can write a script, script on your own, but if you want to make anything of scale, you need people, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, if you've looked at maybe some of where our popular culture has gone today, people are always, um, you know, agonizing over not being given the opportunities they think they deserve or how things aren't as equal as they want. I mean, my sort of raison d'etre has always been just figure it out. You know what I'm saying? No one's going to make your movie for you. Like how badly do you really want to make this movie? And in some sense, yeah, like it's never been more democratized. Like film make, filmmaking technology, it's, it's more accessible than, than, than ever. And you can tell your story, you know, but uh, the process of filmmaking is a gut check. Like you will realize over time, did I really just want to be at a party with like famous people or artists or did I really care about telling this story? Because it's the most humbling, one of the most humbling crafts like out there. You have this great idea and then, you know, you just, it's just the cold hard reality of the economics behind it, of, of what you can tell with what you have. And I've really learned to embrace like, working with what I have, like I casted in this current film that we're right now, like a lot of the actors I've worked with before, and I'm getting a lot out of just being able to give people the opportunity to express themselves locally in a story that is based in old hall about old hall. And it's just very rare. Cause usually like this place is uh, you know, it's, it's a sit in for like some American city in a movie of the week. Mm. But uh, so just like collaborating with other people now, it's become more like, I, I almost get, as much out of that as I do, you know, like whatever I've done on my own, you know, to get this thing off the ground. So. Now I am curious to hear about your, your film, but before we dive into that, uh, just mm -hmm. you know, give us what is your creative process in general? How do you, how do you work? How do you operate? How do you come yeah. up with an idea and execute it? You know, like it's, it's really, I think generally like uh, maybe an easy answer is that I usually make movies about stuff that I'm obsessed with, you know what I'm saying? And in a way, like every film is a dialogue with myself trying to work my way through certain problems, you know, like the movies that I make don't always reflect that because, you know, the economics of, of what I can do, uh, you know, sometimes it may tend to be more like a, uh, you know, maybe, maybe more commercial, say, like maybe more mass, maybe more mass audience uh, oriented or maybe more outhouse, art house oriented. But generally, like, I think if you want to be a filmmaker, you got to learn how to take notes. And I think that that is something that I, I, I love to do. It's just, I think I was just born with a hyper analytic mind, always sort of observing people and situations and always taking notes um insight i don't know what they're... when you say taking notes you mean you literally mean taking notes like... taking notes okay wow taking notes yeah 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 um so but, but it depends on the the product though because um you know like i've got like i don't know a million sort of scripts that i'm working on and and based on different things maybe like a coming of age film about growing up versus you know a film about the art industry or you know, like, for example, I think I mentioned earlier, like I, I worked on a documentary that I just finished and I had that footage on my, it was like over 30 hours of footage. I had it on my hard drive for like five years. Like I just, I didn't do anything with it. And it wasn't until I hit, um, you know, like a, a, a really a bad funk, like this last December, like a depression in December and in January. And it was one that I, I is probably the worst winter of my life. I don't know about you, but it was. Well, I, I think for most, because of, you know, this, the reality mm -hmm. that we're all living with, uh, with COVID-19 and so on, of course, but mm -hmm. continue. Yeah. And so like, I, um, I, I think I was in a bad space mentally, but, you know, depression can sometimes be really inspiring. And one thing I, I, maybe not inspiring, but it can be a teacher, I should say. Like one thing that crossed my mind is what if I can't do this anymore? Wow. You know, making films. You know what I mean? Because I identified so much of my, so much of who I was with becoming this thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just certain, you know, uh, 
I was in a really bad mood or a really, a really bad depression. And it just crossed my mind and it was just a thought experiment and it felt really real. And so I went back into the footage and this is what my friend was expressing the, the, the documentaries about my friend, a musician, just about him chasing his dreams at a young age and then trying to be this, this thing, this musician, and then realizing, you know, what he, what he was really in love with is just the, 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 the process of writing and playing music for the rest of his life. And then that, you know, which I, I would have overlooked in previous years, all of a sudden spoke to me. Hmm. And so within a month, I was, I, well, about six weeks, I finished uh, 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 a rough cut, you know, having gone through 30 hours of footage, like it just made sense all of a sudden. So sometimes we're just looking for things to click like that. Right. Um, because, you know, like it doesn't matter, like if we didn't write the film or we're not the subject in the film, the filmmaker is really telling his own story, you know, and it just took me a while for me to, to sort of uh, accept that that's where I was. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, um, you know, like I, 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 I've given up being a filmmaker. I, I'm still doing it, you know, uh, and I'll probably continue to do it for as long as I can. Um, it's just age, you know, like I'm 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 there with you, man. I'm like mid 30s, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's it's really like I think like I mentioned earlier, it's a dialogue with myself. It's where I am at any given point in my life, and and, and that's what the movie ends up being about. In that dialogue, and if if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to to December uh, because mm. it's it's um, in that dialogue with oneself as far as mm-hmm. the, the need to to create and be just the need to tell a story to create and 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 to share yeah. that dialogue with oneself. How much is being creative? How much is that therapeutic for, for people and, and for you? Like, in other words, you know, the, the, the process of creating, be it a film, writing a story, a script and so on, what, what does that do for you emotionally in terms of when you feel like you're, mm-hmm. uh, you're feeling, you know, down at yeah. most, most Canadian, most, most people get depressed around, Mm-hmm. seasonal depression or whatever they call yeah. it. Uh, don't quote me on that uh, yeah. the guy on the video but you know what I'm saying like, yeah, yeah, I feel you I feel you, yeah, you yeah. Know, around that time of the year mm-hmm. uh, you know people's motivation might be a little down and of course being creative uh, is, is it therapeutic for you well absolutely I mean like this is a very um, maybe boring or technical answer but I think it actually speaks a lot to how our minds work I mean I'm just I was reading some David Allen and, and, and his, he's a productivity guru. And in a nutshell, what he's saying is our minds are whiteboards. They're not meant to hold all these things in it at once. Like I think science says you can hold like seven things in your mind at once. When you have too many things in there, you just get depressed. You know what I mean? You're, you're trying to draw associations. You're trying to problem solve. It's just, you're overwhelmed. There's not enough bandwidth in that. Right. So one thing that he does with his clients is he brings them in and they could be a CEO of like Bell or something. And he sits them down and he has a, like a big stack of paper and he's like, what's on your mind now? And he just writes them out one sheet after another, like everybody, whatever's on their mind. So it could be, it could take a couple hours until their mind is completely empty. And at that point, it's like, yeah, I have nothing left on my mind. And then he'll go through the hundred things and, and come up with some actionable something, you know, some game plan for, for addressing whatever the task is, whatever's on his mind and stuff like that. And in a way, that's what art is. You know what I mean? Like when I was going through that funk, there was just a lot of self doubt and a lot of paranoia, I think about where all this was going. And that process allowed me to get it out, to express it in a way. So uh, yeah, it's definitely therapeutic, but I mean, like a word about depression is like, I think one thing I did learn is like, it's very easy. Like I, I'm, I'm a really routine oriented person. It's really easy to get shit done and to exercise and to be funny and all that shit when you're feeling good. Mm. You know, when you hit the depression, you hit a certain lethargia and you just don't want to do anything. And I think you need, we need to kind of reframe what is a good day. You know what I'm saying? Cause I, like, I think if you've, we, we tend to have like a, like a type or product, productive types, we tend to have this all or nothing mentality. And that actually buries you when you're not feeling so good. 
you know, because you you just you don't do anything. Or if you don't accomplish your goals, you feel like ass. But the thing is, if you were not feeling so good and you managed to do 10 push-ups that day, you sent out two emails. You know what I'm saying? Um, you got to reframe that, understand that that was a good day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That was a good fucking day. As opposed to what it's some other day where you, you know, you, you write five pages of your script, you finish the rough draft, you're, uh, you know, you worked out like your max said, you're, <laughs> you're going out to have beers afterwards, you know, like generally when we do finish something, that's because of a million baby steps that came before it. And we just sort of put the, you know, the, this, the, you know, the, the, the seal on there and it's like, you're, you're done. But I, I think, um, you know, it's in those moments when, when you're zapped of energy that you, you, you really is your opportunity to, to really test yourself. To really see what you're made of in a way and you may not have any piss and vinegar and and, and it's good to just kind of acknowledge that and to know that and, and to just appreciate what you can do in any given moment I, I think i think that's the good mindset to pull yourself out of that funk you know yeah i know it's it, it sounds like it's it's a good way to kind of instill that day-to-day -day balance and and to check in on on yourself right uh, every day and just mm -hmm. find that 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 peace of mind and, and that balance and i think all creative people uh, can, can relate to those struggles of, you know, being somewhat hyper uh, performing at a high level one day, and then maybe not feeling so productive on um, the other. And, you know, I have so many questions to, to ask you on, on just that topic alone. Yeah. Shoot, man. yeah. And, and like, before I get it, you know, I'll, I'll ask you this question and then I'll ask you about your project. Cause I'm really curious to hear about what you're currently working on this film. That's set mm. in Hull. Quebec, Canada. Now, hmm. do you think creative people are maybe uh, assessing productivity as the standard of success when, when, when is, is productivity success in the creative uh, milieu? Like, is, is it hmm. something like the reason why I ask is because, you know, uh, one could spend their entire lifetime working on one film. Yeah. Uh, in, in releasing this film and let's say nobody watches it and nobody cares mm -hmm. or, and, or, you know, or, or the whole world watches it and it becomes, you know, a, a big, yeah. or you could have someone who releases a film every six months uh, and, and garners momentum uh, at a small niche sort of, uh, you know, has a yeah. following like is, is, yeah. productivity, is, pro is being hyper productive or being very, you know, just being productive is that successful for a creative person, it's particularly? Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, well, I guess that question should be directed at, at me because I, I simply don't know what, what other people, how other people define success. Yeah. Um, but for me, like, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I like to think I could have gone to L.A. And, and, and hacked my way on sets and stuff like that. But that was never what I wanted. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I figured maybe eventually I'll end up there. I, I moved to Toronto for a bit and I've worked on sets before. And I was like, you know, sets are great and all, but I only it, it's a grind. It's, it's a lifestyle. Um, I only want to work on on sets that are, you know, my films. I only want to work on my stuff. So I think honing my voice and discovering myself was really more of my my interest um wow how do i define success like it's weird right like we my last movie uh peter len which was a film i shot in ottawa and in gadno um shout out to the canada council for giving me some money for that like we headlined uh, the film festival the ottawa canadian film festival and that was like my first kind of big you know moderately big sort of uh gig um, I used to work for a film festival, just like on a side note. And, and I realized, um, you know, it, it, it ain't a joke, man. Like, like if you make a small film, a short film, you could sandwich that in between a bunch of other short films. And those are the most popular programs because everyone goes to see these films, people who made them, people run them, people relative. So those are sold out. If you're talking about a feature, you're standing on your own. Like, like you are, People like if you're programming these films, people got to want to buy to see them. You know what I'm saying? To, to buy a ticket to see them, you got to put butts in seats. And, and 
you know, it's, it's always been a rude awakening for me. Like even on that film, you know, they was damn near like sold out at the thing. And that was kind of nice. And it wasn't the greatest film. Like it was okay for me, you know, and I learned a lot about it, about myself and, and, and filmmaking. Uh, but you know, my, my mom was there. My dad, my dad was there. And like, and actually a lot of it was based on like my personal life and, and, you know, like that was nice. Like, you know, cause they finally got to see as, as you can imagine. I mean, with some immigrant parents, they don't really know, like, what are you doing, Carmami? You know, <laughs> like, what do you do? Like, why do you go and do these things? You know, and, and then finally they get to see the sort of fruits of, because a, a lot of my other stuff was small and it'd be international and no one could go and see it. Th that was cool. So was that success? Like that was a form of success for sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just like, uh, like goals are great, but uh, you can't attach your happiness to the outcome. I, I, I really think that, um, one thing that I have learned, like just in the past little while too, a certain shift in me is like, uh, striving and, and pursuing goals actually becomes more interesting when you don't attach it, the outcome to your happiness, you know, you, you're, you're happy coming into it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think to get to that happy place though, you have to take yourself a lot less seriously. You know what I'm saying? That if your if your happiness is conditional on that that outcome that goal, I mean, th there's like that is just a recipe for anxiety and you know and control having issues with control. Right. You know, you, you'll 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 see the people you work with less as collaborators and more as people that are a part of your grand scheme of things. You know what I mean? Like like right. you're this thing, and right. you know, like I don't really. It's not, it's not, it's not sustainable for, for somebody is, like, like this is, I, I don't mean to interrupt there, but this no, is interesting because like, are, are you, are you, would it be fair to say that, that you're intrinsically motivated? You're, you're motivated to, from what you've said, it sounds like you're motivated to tell a story and, and you don't attach yourself to the end product, the yeah. in the film, you're more focused on the process and, yeah. and, and that means something to you, but you're not, uh, and I guess success is and much like happiness. That's an inside job, right? It's not yeah. something where we attach to like, oh, it won an award or th this, that, and, and the other. As a creative person, is this something that you, I, I guess you kind of answered it already, but is this something that you kind of found out through a few projects? Or yeah. Uh, absolutely. Like I, I, didn't, I wasn't born uh, thinking like this. Like I think uh, younger folks could have access to some really good, uh, you know, Instagram quotes and they may be able to say this, but it takes failing like a motherfucker, man. Yeah. <laughs> I failed so much. Like I think my first feature, which was nothing to write home about, it was a disaster. But out of like a hundred festival submissions, it got into two. You know what I'm saying? And they were just like really small, small festivals. And, you know, it, it was just at the beginning, the heartbreak was real. Like every time I, I got rejected, it was just nasty, you know. But, um, you know, like it's, it's just a part of it. Like I think uh, especially if you come from, say, an immigrant household where there's this uh, risk averse mentality, do not do things that doesn't bring in money that is going to take up a lot of time become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. Yeah, I was pretty lucky. My, my parents were not that hard on me, but they still had a residue of that sort of value system. Um, and I think it, it's kind of good to an extent because you do want results, mm -hmm. right? And if you're serious about results, you got to be honest about where you are in life and how good you are. Like I'm, I'm not as, and it, you know, here's the thing you learn about filmmakers. Uh, it's just so weird. It's like they think just by virtue of wanting to express themselves, they're good at what they do. No, they're not. You know what I'm saying? And 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 like it's like it's like somebody who thinks like they're a good singer just because they want to sing. Right. You gotta learn this shit. You gotta you know you gotta you gotta learn like like storytelling models and 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 the structures, three act structures. You gotta you gotta break. You gotta read scripts and break them down so you could write a script. And I think that's something I kind of learned even later on in life, like, you know, in my thirties, like even just recently I've taken writing more seriously. Um, yeah. I think, I don't know what was the question. 
isn't this a process continuous though? Like, isn't it fair to say like that this mm -hmm. process of learning and refining one's uh, trade and, and, and art, yeah. like that's a continuous. Absolutely. And failure is progress. Mm -hmm. Like you have to fail. And I've just seen so many artists, filmmakers and such. And, and uh, it's just, they either failed or they weren't treated right by somebody they worked with and they just collapse. And I understand, like I've been on sets where, you know, I've just killed myself to find the money to pay people. And I've been like, you know, just walked on by ungrateful people. And, you know, when, and, and those situations happen, I think we've talked about this actually at some point earlier and it happens, but it's just like, in those moments, you got to look at yourself. Like, I think I, I tend to think of myself as an old man. Like if I was like 65 or whatever, 70, and then some kid comes up to me and says, I used to be a filmmaker. And I'm like, yeah. And they still, well, why'd you quit? Mm -hmm. And if my answer was be, if I'm going to be honest with myself, my answer was because that person mouthed off at me. Uh, I wouldn't, it wouldn't feel good. Right. You know what I'm saying it wouldn't feel good. And and the truth is when some when a lot of people say why they quit, they'll tend to sort of exaggerate how bad the situation was just to kind of justify yeah. having made the decision to quit. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it just may very well be, you know, like if if I lose the love for this or it's just not me anymore, it's like that'll be it and it'll be it'll be okay. I'll I'll, I'll walk away from it, you know. Um but otherwise, I, th I think one of the things that really keeps me going is it's just a weird thing. It's just like, this is a little voice in my head or a feeling that says, why not do it? It's why not do it? Like, what else are you doing? You know, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. Like, why not just fucking do it? Yeah. And I mean, like, the, the, the telling of the story is, is, I think, in any art form, I'm, I'm just going to, like, I, I think just getting it done is... Yeah is probably the, the, the hardest part of it. You know, if it's yeah. publishing your, your writing, your poetry, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if it's getting your film done, if it's, you know, attending that recital, I think just getting it done is, is, is very challenging for, for creatives because a lot tends to be at risk. And as you mentioned, the, the, the fear of failure for, for a lot averts them from even trying, you know, a, a lot mm -hmm. of people give up on, on, on their creativity be it the development of, of their art, uh, the, the skill sets involved in their art, or, or trying to take a different approach, you know? It, I guess it's different. It's a case-by-case -case sort of thing yeah. different for different people. But now, Alexander, tell us about this film you're currently working on. I'm yeah. really curious to hear about it. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, uh, I had a lot of ideas, and it's just they... Somehow they, they work themselves out in... The, the, this story about a cleaning lady who's a drug addict who act, you know, for, for whatever reason, got her sister involved in drugs. Her sister goes missing, turns up dead. And then this cleaning lady makes it her mission to find whoever killed her. Wow. So, you know, I, I think when, when you're making a film, you've got to think of things from, like so many different facets. Like it's not just uh, say writing a novel and you let your imagination go. You have to be really practical in filmmaking. So I knew I wanted to film something in my hood of your hall. You know what I'm saying? You know, the, you, which is the, a legendary, the, legendary neighborhood. If, if anyone, yeah, familiar, this is uh, this building is so old, it's like falling apart. It's awesome though. But as, yeah. as a storyteller, I'm sure for you, oh yeah, you know, each I time you look be. around, you could see a scene. But mm -hmm. please. To, to tell us more about this film. Yeah, well, like, to, to, just to kind of give you a sense of, like, the mentality I think you, you kind of have to have, it's like, there's a joke about the, the producer who walks into a writer's room and then he drops a bunch of shit on the table, random shit, and he says, this is, this is what I can get for free. What's the movie about? Wow. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, like the writer, I'm looking at my hood. This is what I can get for free. Right. You know what I'm saying? And my hood is sick. Like, I mean, it's been used in, uh, what was it? Like, not too long ago, it was in On the Road, that Hollywood film. It doubled as like a 1950s American town. It's been, in, I don't know how many, but it's just, I want the seedy side of this, of this, this city. You know what I'm saying? And there's, what else is free? There's a, there's a, there's a drug problem here, man. 
Oh, is there? Yeah. yeah, there's just there's a lot of junkies around here. It's known as being a shady hood. So a lot of the characters that I came it's up got with, personality though. Oh I yeah, a lot of texture. It's you know, personality and and, and an interesting energy. But uh, yeah, sorry, I, I don't mean to inter interrupt. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, it's just super diverse as well. And so basically, the characters that I came up with, I didn't really come up with. They're just they're in the, they're in town. Like this is, yeah. you know, like the cleaning lady. The there, there's a uh, you know this this Filipino who also works for the cleaning company. So the the the, the, the story is based around kind of this cleaning company and and um, the drama that goes down there. And uh, there's a lot of side stories. And basically, she's trying to find out who's uh, killed her sister. I can't really talk say too much about it, but uh, that's where it's at. And you know, uh, I think it was maybe after the first draft, I talked to my production manager and she said, you know what, if you're going to convince some of these juries to give you money, uh, Canada Council, actually, we were successful with them, thankfully. So we have some funding for this. She, she, she told me you should make it uh, COVID friendly. Mm -hmm. And so because so this was last year. Right. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know, since I work in a home, I was just pounding out the script while doing the video editing and shit for, for my other job. And so I. Uh, I figured, you know what? Yeah, let's just write it into the script. And, and and it became a crucial part of the story, which is that this cleaning company is going down under because government offices are empty and no one needs their services. So not only is she, you know, trying to find her, uh, her sister's killer, everyone's losing their job and everyone's just it's a doggy dog at this company, right? Mm -hmm. So I wrote that in there. And, you know, I, I think that's kind of the approach when you're making an indie film, which is you're trying to create a perfect storm of everything, making this thing as timely and as unique and as, and, and as important as possible in this moment. So a lot of the actors I work with on Peter Lynn, you know what I mean? I brought back a lot of the same people. I want everybody local, you know what I'm saying? Because it's just like, I mean, I want to develop the talent here, but it's also cheaper. It's also just uh, more convenient for me. And, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the stories, it's across different genres. It's got like, it's, you know, some comedy and thriller in there. And it's it's going to be a, a real bitch to make, man, because it, it, it is beyond anything I've done before production value wise. But like a word about the process, like I think it's it's taken this pandemic for me to accept that I really like how crazy it drives me <laughs> making movies. You know, like, you know, you know, they say you should do something that makes you afraid something that you're scared to do every day one thing and right. i love that i i love how i have this deadline it's like oh man i need to find this venue and so i'm just driving around and then i see this venue and i walk in i don't know anybody and i'm forced to talk to the owner and ask him would you be open for us to film here he speaks well french probably doesn't even understand me but it's like i'm just i'm forced to do it and it, you know, and, and I think that's the kind of growth I need that I don't really get from the Joe job, even though that is also interesting, you know, um, you know, at, um, it hey, this is really fascinating. Are you documenting this process in terms of uh, the story behind the story of, of, of the script you're writing and, and this yeah. film you're producing? Are you doing kind of like, a, are you journaling? Do you have a diary? Because I, I, you're really challenging yourself, right, with this. Uh, you know, do one thing every day that scares you. I believe that's from a song about yeah. sunscreen from, no, yeah. is that the song? Yeah, yeah, everyone. Knows. I don't even remember who said it. I just yeah. kind of remember. I, I think it's it. Buzz Lerman, the song from Buzz Batman. Lerman. Oh my God, yeah. Is that, oh my 1999, God. where were fuck, you? Uh, anyway, fuck, do one thing fuck, every day that scares you. It's yeah, like, fuck. <laughs> Maybe that's where he got it from, Brainwash. Yeah. I remember no, that song. Awesome. What I'm saying is, are you documenting because for me, as I'm hearing you talk about this, I'm like, man, there's like, there's so much content behind the content. You, you know what yeah. I'm saying? There's yeah, absolutely, man. And yeah, I've kept a journal, of, you know, since I was 24, Okay. you know, and I, I do have a bit of a quota. I try to do like at least four pages a week. You know what I mean? Uh, keep up with that. Um but yeah, I mean, there's also like BTS that'll eventually happen at some point, like behind the scenes where I can kind of describe the process more thoroughly or and visually as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, of course, I, I document everything, man, as much as I can, um, mainly in the journal. Uh, but, but, but as well, you know, uh, when it comes to submitting grants, like, I don't know, like, I think the Canada Council grant was like 300 pages. It was just so long, man. 
including the scripts in there. Like it was just so much work. And, and I did Calc as well for um, Quebec uh, provincial arts there. And in, within that, you have to write your treatment. You have to come, how did you come up with these ideas? Uh, you know, uh, who are you hiring and why? And, and so you, you're, the good thing about grants, I mean, I don't want to be on government uh, publicly funded uh, arts funding for forever, man. Like I, I'd love to, at some point, you know, we'll see where this one goes and then and, and, and move up to maybe streaming services and, and start pitching to them and stuff. But um, the good thing about the grants is that it does make you get your shit together, man. You know what I mean? And I always encourage my friends. I send them, I send them templates for doing stuff. And, you know, a lot of people, it's just not their thing. You know, I've been on grants juries as well, which is also very helpful to see how people deliberate behind the scenes. Right. You know, everything from, you know, like the, the, the sort of trends that, 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 that come out uh, in, in film ideas to the ideologies behind them. It's, re- it's really interesting when you're on juries and you have artists that would be on virtually every protest you can imagine. But then behind the scenes, they'll read something that, you know, uh, somebody who references their identity and they just throw it out because the movie sucks. You know what I mean? Like, like, like the cash value of, of some of these ideas in when it comes to deliberating with like uh, um, which ideas deserve money and stuff like that. So that's really important. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, man, I can't even remember what the question was. I just went on like, well, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, Alexander, because that, that administrative side of, of the creative mm. workflow, people generally mm. detest, you know. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, the, you know, you mentioned 300 word or 300 page document to fill out like that alone almost gave me a heart attack and a stroke. You know, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like 300 pages. Holy yeah. Thing, man. But it is what it is. It's, you know, as you mentioned, you got to do the work and there's that administrative Mm -hmm. aspect uh that pertains to to the financing that's so that's extremely crucial to your line of work as a creative person question that i have for you is how do you motivate your crew you've worked with this crew Mm -hmm. and the talent to perform at their best what's your approach i think i've witnessed your your work uh you know i've witnessed you direct before right but right Tell me about your style yeah, yeah. of leadership uh, in terms of yeah. how you direct and lead a team. Yeah, yeah but to, to just, to just a word about like what you're saying about the giving you a heart attack. I mean, like, it's not like I'm this like machine that just doesn't stop. Like the, like the thing is, after I finished Peter Lane and I did a festival uh, circuit for like a year, I, I took a, like a year off. I, I was burned out for a year. Wow. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do any other creative work. And I had serious doubts of whether or not I want to continue with this because the thing did not, it did, didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Right. But then, you know, the inclination just comes back. The minute I'm not burned out, I want to do it again. But, but as for like directing like people and hiring people, like I haven't hired my crew yet. Like I have a couple main people on right now that I've worked with that are just solid professionals. Like, like the thing is when it comes to like casting and, and, um, and, and crew like like nine when it comes to directing like actors like 90 percent of the job is casting mm. like smart directors hire people they have to direct the least they're just already there right you know what i'm saying so when it comes to the craftsmen it's like i want to hire people that know what they're doing like I, I'm, I'm gonna be the weak link there you know what i'm saying like uh i'll have certain expectations uh a certain schedule that i've got to meet that and and we'll have to like that's really the 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 ass to the fire but otherwise it's like uh you know like i need them and um i i try to stay out of their way i try to make it easier on people um and 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 often it's just it's not being an ego or anything like that on set it's just really you know one thing you realize is like if you're really really nice but you're like a sloppy director some people will want to work with you again you can be like hitler but if you stay on schedule and people get paid and people get off and get their breaks they'll want to work for you again like i'm not saying you should be hitler but when people go to work they want to get the shit done and go home afterwards you know what i mean like 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 they 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 want to have some time to themselves at home and i'm the same way too like i don't want to work 16 hours man like i've i've worked like on sets over 24 hour days wow 
like just like falling asleep and, and exploitation beyond anything, you know? And um, so like, like all that comes down to like how ambitious is your idea and, and what can you get feasibly done and how much are you paying people? And you're, you're, you're constantly having to weigh these, these things, right? Cause if you're not paying people enough, they'll bail the minute before the production and you're fucked. So you got to pay them enough money that it's worth their, their while, you know? So, yeah. What are some of the most, uh, from your experience, what would you say are some of the most misunderstood aspects of, of filmmaking and, and visual storytelling for the non-initiated, for, for people who don't know, mm -hmm. uh, who've never, you know, worked on a video project or a film mm -hmm. or whatever, what would you tell them is, is the most misunderstood aspect of the business? Like, well, I think we, we alluded to it earlier, like a good, maybe like if it takes three years to make a film, maybe a good like 90% of it is administrative. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like everyone, you know, people love the idea of being a director, like wearing a, a scarf in the middle of summer and having a loud mouth and yelling at people and just looking like a badass, some sort of a French badass. And that's cool too. But honestly, like I'm so tired when I'm on a set, I'm wearing like, a shitty t-shirt and some beat up jeans. And I'm just like looking at the skit and just pumping it out. Maybe one day when I could hire more assistants, I'll, I'll, I'll wear that scarf in the middle of summer, that, that full was, whatever it's called, the French thing. But it's like, otherwise, um, you know, like w w <sighs> during Pierland, like I was just so tired, man. Like, I mean, I'd just be laying on my bed and I'd be like, no one's because you can't, afford to hire more people no one's going to do that budget you know what i'm saying no one's going to do your bookkeeping in 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 a certain moment and it's like i did have a bookkeeper but i had to do some stuff afterwards and it's like if you don't do it it doesn't get done it's just the math is there you know what i'm saying it, it's not just the coming up with the great ideas and and you know what but one thing i've learned though is i think you learn to respect yourself more and people do respect you more uh generally it's almost like being a producer who has, who has had no technical experience telling people to do things versus being from that background, being a technical producer, carrying the gear around up the hill, being on those hot days, shooting in the rain. People are more apt to take advice, to take direction from that person because they've been there. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and sometimes you, you, you could just see through people in, in a way. And, and, and that kind of feeds your instinct, to, you know, to, to know who to work with and who not to work with, who's real, who's not, you know. Um, it's yeah. interesting because I, I, I've, uh, as I mentioned before, I've, I've seen you in action directly yeah. uh, before. And we don't have to talk about the, 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 that, that project or, or whatever. Mm. It was something on the commercial side. Mm. But the point is, I see, and you were very, it seemed you were very, uh, very relaxed. You were calm, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Very chill. You were telling mm -hmm. people what, what to do. And it seemed, at least from, from my perspective, like, like you, you were enjoying the process, but you were not stressed. You were not uh, annoyed. You knew what you were doing. And the people mm -hmm. around you were, were collaborative and, and following that mm -hmm. direction. Can you tell us a, f a funny story in regards to the dynamic of, of working on, on projects and how sometimes, you know, things can go sideways? Uh, I don't know if that's ever ha happened to yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, man. Like, well, I mean, I did work like I worked for a very probably one of the more successful directors out of the Philippines. He'll remain nameless. I wouldn't work with the guy again, but. You know, he had this idea of making he, maybe doing the um, the the Inland Empire sort of process of filmmaking, which is like with like David Lynch made a movie or he made it up as he went along. And this guy, this guy thought, you know, um, I'm going to do that. And he had a writer uh, at his hip and it's it's just the blind leading the blind man. You know what I mean? Like it was just such a bad fucking experience um I, I was never that big on the guy's storytelling instincts to begin with and and that just kind of exposed a lot to me like in in in, in that moment and in a way it was very it was very um it was, it was a good experience though because i just you you've really got to respect and value your 
you're casting your crew's time. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, across the board, unless you're you're got a big budget or whatever, and they're all unionized, like no one's really getting paid that much money to do this. And um, you know, especially out there, like that was one of the huge. I should say, yeah, I've worked and lived in the Philippines for a little while and worked on films out there. Um, the classism and uh, the exploitation was just like something that I, you know, I think scarred me. Um, yeah, it was just so bad, and. You know, like like when when you got people coming out, and and, and I, th- I think maybe what you saw was that like, a, you know, a director who shoots to edit, so a director who knows what shots he needs to tell the story, and that's exactly what I was doing. It was just I was I, I knew I needed I had a little shot list, and I knew I needed, you know, A to Z to tell the story, and um, you know, it was really nothing fancy. I just I was trying to bang out what I needed, and that's that's actually more of of what I. Uh, of what I do, uh, um, well, that is how I, I work. I should say on like scripted projects, like outside of work and stuff like that. Um, at this level, though, there's a lot more maybe hand holding um, before uh, the shoot, so there's a lot of rehearsals and stuff like that. And you know, I think I think in those moments, that's when the director comes out. Like in 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 Pure Land, like I I cast uh, uh, Celestine Caravaggio and she hadn't really had much acting experience and and it was just because the the lead actress i had was in the united states and it was very hard to bring her over i i literally had to cast this 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 woman really early and in in the process like some people would have called it brutal but like it was just very like frank and honest about you know how what the expectations were and what she could do and and trying to, to to grow her her range and stuff like that and you know while while the movie in the end wasn't you know, did this, you know, fucking incredible film. I mean, she won best actress at at least one film festival and she's actually had, she's been, she's been really successful like, ever since she's been on a bunch of commercials and a bunch of TV shows. And that actually made me feel really good. You know, like I um, played a part in her, in her development and success, you know? Um, so yeah, like, before the, the the actual filming like it's pretty clear like it only maybe it'll take me maybe two or three sessions with the main actors to kind of figure out what the range is what the tone is of the film and then everybody else I'll maybe have one session with and then so when, when we're there it's just banging it out man you know what i'm saying just tick ticking ticking those shots off like every scene off and it's not about fucking around you know like at some point yeah it'll be great if, like spielberg was like you know i i don't have uh I don't rehearse with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep's uh, on, on, on the post, the movie. I just, I don't like to rehearse because, you know, sometimes it would have been a great take. So I'll just sort of shoot it. Well, that's great. If you're working with them, like what the fuck, man, I could give them any script and they'll make it good. But when you're, when you're working with amateurs, right. you know what I mean? And people who don't have much experience, you, you gotta make sure that they know, you know, what they're getting into. For sure. Now, what's the most interesting and unique experience you've ever witnessed in your line of work? Uh, You know, like I've had a lot of cool experiences. Like I remember in the Philippines, I filmed in this occult village and that was really odd. It was interesting. I filmed the live birth like for this film. They needed a cutaway because the lead actress was was pregnant in the thing. And then but they wanted an actual baby coming out. So I was like kind of kind of on uh, standby at the studio, but uh, thankfully like the Philippines is overpopulated. So babies are always been popping up. So they throw me in the van, ladies waiting, holding in the baby. And I wow. felt that. And I was like, Oh my God, I had like a 50 mil prime and I was right there. So it was at Venice actually that film. Um, and apparently did pretty good. I didn't, I saw it like once a long time ago. It was pretty good. Um, stuff like that. I mean, you know, doing short documentaries is, is often really cool. Like, you know, I was, uh, a friend of mine invited me out to a fiesta in the Philippines and we were hanging out in Manila and it's just, this this gang rumble broke out and I was filming all of it. And it was crazy. It ended up being this experimental short that kind of went all over the place. I had legs, you know, one day I woke up, it was my birthday. I read the paper and th- there was this guy who was uh, this old guy. He was blind his whole life. He fell down the stairs and then he went to the hospital. They fixed his face and told him, you're not really blind, actually. Uh, you just have bad cataracts. 
So it took him out for the 68 he could see for the first time. So I, I did wow. a documentary on him. Wow. You know, like the, the possibilities are endless. Like I think people are like, there's so many interesting stories out there. Right. If this thing never worked out, if I tanked, I would always be looking for small stories to tell like that. You know? So is it fair to say you, you prefer the, the, the short storytelling or short documentaries over fictional feature films? Uh, you know, like short docs are fun uh, because they're they're cheap and they're doable, and and you know, with with th there's no restrictions, there's no limitations to to what you can do. I mean, especially in posts and stuff, you can tell however the hell you want to. When you when you're looking at these big, massive like projects, these feature films, like um, it's it's a whole nother kind of commitment and uh, a whole nother skill set almost. If anything, you are not free to create in that situation. It's like, you have your story and you've got to tell that story and you, and you have to tell it as economically efficiently as possible. Um, so, I mean, I, I enjoy all of it. It's, it's usually when I'm burned out after a huge project, I'll maybe do something small, you know what I mean? Just to kind of keep things going. And I think that's really important to you not to totally, um, you know, stop your, your practice you know, whatever it is, you know, like I've done little things like street photography as well. And, you know, some drawing and stuff like that. So still, uh, I like, you still paint? I haven't painted in a long time, but I'm really, I, I, I started drawing again and I could see myself getting back into painting at some point. Like, I think it's, that is liberating compared to filmmaking. You is know? there any transferability, uh, transferability of skills uh, from, you know, painting, uh, drawing to visual storytelling. Is there any you know, classes over? Well, well, I think definitely when it comes to composition. You know, um, you know, photography. Obviously, that's obvious. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, it just it's, it translates. But I, I think it, if there's any relation, it's um, it's just a, a certain uh, appreciation for expression. Mm -hmm. And, and that's it, you know. Do you have a community of fellow filmmakers that you can rel rely on for feedback, support, uh, and, and all that sort of stuff? Or, or do you roll solo as, as a creative person? You know, I, I do know, like, for example, when I've got a synopsis right now, like I figured out the, 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 where this story is going, like the, like the, the basic dna of the story i will send that to, to to various people who i think will give me some good feedback something important um th that i could use and and really what you're looking for is for them to to, to rip it apart you know what i mean like you you want them to point out where uh um you know where it doesn't make sense or, or where it could be strengthened and you know where it's weak because this ain't like writing a book it, you know, I, I could write a book afterwards and fine. But when you're looking at a film, it's like you, you are, you're spending a lot of money and, and you're, 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 it's just, it's so much more physically taxing. The stakes are so much higher to get it right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where it all starts a script. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Now, Alexander, I know earlier on you, you kind of, Allude, excuse me, you kind of alluded to this, but I'm, I'm going to ask you, have you ever considered like quitting visual storytelling and filmmaking? Has that, has that thought crossed your mind? Uh, if so, like, like tell us the, the, that story as to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a creative person in, in this practice that you invested X amount of years in, like, have you thought of just saying, okay, I've had enough of this. I'm moving on. Has that ever happened to you? Like I've, uh, you know, I've been on hiatus from it and I've, I've been burned out from it. And yeah, I, I, I have considered stopping it, but even in those moments, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I know it's only a matter of time where this thing comes back. And uh, you know what? Like if I had a kid or something like that right now, I don't knock somebody up and I had to, <laughs> you know, like settle down and really focus on bringing in that paycheck. Uh, the priorities would change, no doubt. Uh, but I think 
that why not is always there. It's like, it, it's what, uh, I don't know. It's my raison d'etre. It's my, it's my thing, dude. Like just telling stories and I can't explain why, you know what I mean? Um, what would you be doing if you weren't telling stories? That is a great, that, that is a great question. And I, I think that's, that was maybe the crux of my crises, like, uh, December, January, what would I do? And, um, I, you know, it, it's, there, there, there are certain things like, for example, I used to play guitar and then I stopped, you know, maybe around 19, I just wasn't going the way I wanted to. And I never regretted stopping. Uh, I'd like to pick it up every now and then, like uh, get back into it. Great. But, uh, you know, when you fall out of love with something, leaving it is not a hard thing. If it's hard, the chances are you're either leaving it against your will or uh, you don't want to leave it. You, you, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I, have, I have no idea, man. Like, 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 I think uh, I've, I've gone through a process of like sort of learning to kind of let go from the identity of being a filmmaker and just, just letting it be what it is, which is something that I enjoy doing. And I don't know really what the result of that is going to be. I, I, I can see a shift in, in me right now. I'm not as anxious at this point in filmmaking. And, and maybe it's because the ego's gotten out of the way and it's just uh, enjoying the process, you know? What would I do? I don't know, man. Like, um, I, I have no idea. Like, uh, I've, I've got my day job, of course. Like, maybe I would do something boring within you know the within the the state you know <laughs> right, right. but it's like who knows man I, I've, I've always considered like I mean, if i had money like i would love to do a lot of things like open up a food truck you know a little cafe or something like that like provide food you know feed people i think that's kind of cool i have no idea honestly. what's the best advice you've ever been given um it can well, be film related or it can be life, whichever one or both. Yeah, well, I, I guess, I guess, you know, uh, I mean, like I learned from a woman even more so than a man that you have to make do with what you have, like make the best with what you have. Um, and I think that is applicable to everything, you know, and, 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 and be grateful for what you have. Um, some of the the worst advice I've ever heard is actually uh, I, I hear this all the time. People say it, and I think they just say it because it rhymes, like "fake it till you make it." I hate that shit. Wow. It makes no sense. Like we shouldn't we should encourage people to be fake. You know what I'm saying? Have skills, learn. You know what I'm saying? And and the thing is, like we've all worked for these fucking dinosaurs. You know what I mean? Who had learned I don't know three things in 1962. And, and, and they just refuse to adapt and, and to, to the current scene, you know what I mean, to, to how comms are today or visual storytelling. Those people, you know, have made it and continue to fake it. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like they're not there. And, and there's just so much ego in, in a lot of them. And, and I don't want to be one of those people. You know, what inspires me is when these older folks are just like, like they're so nutty about this and, and, and there's a new technology or something or, and, 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 and they know the kids know it. So they want to learn from the kids, you know, like those people are constantly growing, you know what I mean? Um, and those are the best people to work with, you know, continuous growth and, and investment in self and, and learning is, is definitely a win-win. And I, I think you mentioned in terms of the best advice, essentially it boils down to like being resilient and having gratitude for, 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 for your experience and yeah. what you have to, uh, to offer. But uh, I also wanted to know, like, as a filmmaker, is there a particular director that, that you look up to or do you have a particular film that really kind of, I guess, what's your favorite film and, and who's your favorite uh, director? Yeah, well, I guess those are the, probably both the same question because I, I don't only really look at... Uh you know, like uh, my, my favorite director would naturally have to be the person who directed my favorite film. Otherwise it just wouldn't make any sense. I mean, like best director is probably the most overrated award you could win. Cause it means that you're directing, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, 
shine brighter than the actual work. And, and if anything, you want everything to just be of its own thing, you know, like, like a film should be a film. And, you know, like if the directing makes, pulls you out of the experience, then it's not a good thing. But I mean, like I love, and maybe he's like the antithesis of what I am. It's so interesting. You need, you need an opposite and, and it's Tarkovsky, you know, Tarkovsky directed Stalker and that's my favorite film of all time. Wow. And he was just, uh, you know, he knew he had a very particular vision of who he was at a young age. He was like 27 when he had Ivan's childhood and he knew who he was. And, and the thing is like, he, he did not care for the, the mass audience. You know, he didn't care about commercialism. I do, you know what I'm saying? I like, I do believe film was made for a mass audience, but I mean, his work is, uh, you know, I can't remember who said it, but it's the films that put you asleep in the theater that actually keep you up at night. You know what I'm saying? And the boring films, I actually like boring films and soccer, I think took me like two or three sittings to get through the first time I thought, but I've seen it several times since. And it's just the, the most brilliant fucking film I've ever seen in my life. It's why we make films. Uh, he died at a young age though. Um, like he was like 45, I think it was like, he was, he was anally retentant on set. Like he was so, you know, like there's a field there and he wants to film the field. And then uh, there were flowers there. So he gets his crew out. He's like, I, I don't want the flowers there in the field. So they go out and they pick up, pick up the flowers. And they're like, are we ready to shoot? And he's like, no, we're not ready to shoot. He's like, why? And he's like, cause it looks like you picked the flowers. <laughs> you know like he shot soccer twice you know what i mean and, and and that is kind of my worst nightmare as far as like working for a director somebody who's so oc who's crazy like i think i am so i do have some oc but i'm not like that you know what i'm saying someone who's so unwilling to adapt to what is but i mean his work speaks for itself you know what i'm saying um i guess maybe there's a bit of a i don't know like 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 I'm, I'm speaking through my experience because the thing is I'm kind of glad I didn't have success at a young age mm -hmm. and I'm realizing that more and more now how much it fucks, fucks you up. And if I have success later on, great. Who knows if it will happen, but like big success, he died when he was 45 and in his later years, he was already a parody of himself. So, so th there's something happens when you have success, people all of a sudden uh, assign certain characteristics and attributes to who you are. And then there's this feedback loop where you read that and maybe you get addicted to the validation and you realize, you know what, that's who I am. And then you're Tarkovsky making our Tarkovsky film. Right. And so you're a parody and his later films are like, this is so, it's almost like a mockery of his, of his, of his work. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and he died young and maybe that's a part of it, which is just like, uh, we tend to, you know, maybe romanticize people who die young, you know, and, and, and think their work is, is better than it was. But I mean, I've, I've always loved him and, you know, I've read his book and, um, yeah, stalker is easily my favorite film. Alexander, where can we find you online? Where can we follow up on, on your, on your projects? I don't know if you're, if you're on Twitter, Instagram. And all that. Yeah. You know, that's so interesting, man. Like I was just about to set up a site, but I've been, it's taken me forever to set up a site. Um, I don't have Twitter. I think that's my contribution to the conversation. It's just not being on Twitter. I do have an Instagram, uh, like ask at ask, ask anonymous um and that i update you know i don't know every now and then it's just some street photography on there but i i will have to you know um develop more of an online presence it's something i i've under grown to understand over the next little while and i think it's just the projects themselves that are sort of uh taking up my time um yeah but uh so yeah so th that's my instagram at some point um i'll have a site and you know i can direct people towards that well, thank you very much for, for your time. This has been a really interesting uh, conversation. And uh, I want to thank you for, for, you know, giving us a lot of insight into the world of, of filmmaking from, from your perspective mm -hmm. and point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. It's great.